So this is the uh, the lecture on stable isotopes. So there was an introductory uh, uh, lecture to this lecture, I guess, which was more of a, a talk video thing, uh, which explains some of the, the the basics behind what isotopes are um, and some of the, the the physics behind why isotopes fractionate, uh, both in terms of kinetic isotope fractionation and equilibrium isotope fractionation. So you might want to watch that video first, uh, or um, alternatively, you might want to watch that video afterwards if you get to points in this video which uh, which you don't understand. Okay, so I'll, I'll link that somewhere somehow uh, from uh, from this video. Uh, okay, so uh, going on to the uh, the main lecture now. So this is this is kind of where we want you to 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 be to be able to use this information. Okay, so this is a a, a plot from a paper about calcium isotopes. Okay, so that that's kind of not really relevant to the point I'm trying to make here, but we've got a, a bunch of data. And some, and some variability in that data. And we want to be able to look at this and understand why that variability has arisen, okay? what it's actually telling us, okay? and then use some kind of our, our, our critical analysis as a good scientist to be able to, to look into this and see if this is making sense. Does it, does it fit with how isotopes should behave, or are these guys just, just Muppets? Um, they're, not, they're not Muppets. I'm just zooming in onto one of those plots there. So this is a plot of the isotope composition on the vertical axis and on the horizontal axis, the temperature in which they perform some experiments. So one of the questions we might want to ask is, um, we want to be critical, we, want to, we might want to ask, well, first of all, um, from a, just a, a data analysis point of view, they've not put the, the error bars on their data points, which is it's a bit sneaky. And if you look at the size of their error bar, which, they've, which they have put on representative but on every data point, it does look a bit, a bit large compared to the variation. So maybe some of this vari variability we're seeing in the data, some, some of these trends from down here to up here, maybe that's not real. Okay? Maybe that's just random noise because they can't measure it that well. Okay? They've also uh, plotted this data point in a slightly smaller symbol than the other open circles. Uh, circles. It's clearly triangles. Um, the open triangles there, you see, so they, they, they've, they've, they've basically ignored that data point in their interpretation. And they might have a reason for that. They might have messed up that analysis. There might be some record of that in their notebooks. But without that information, that looks a bit sketchy. But one of the things, if we just take the data at face value, okay, would we expect there to be a variation in isotope ratio with temperature? Okay, so... Would we expect that to be the case? Um, and, and, and I guess also, would we expect it to change with different temperatures? Okay? In this case, it's looking like it's completely changed its sign. Okay? So one of the things we might want to think about are, do we understand enough about how isotope systems work to, to answer that question? Do we expect there to be a variation with isotopes and temperature? And do we expect that to change sign as you, go, as you increase or decrease temperature? Okay, so without that, without knowing that, we can't really start to critically, critically analyze this, this data set. Okay, so this is what this lecture and the introductory video was kind of all about. Okay, it's trying to figure out if this is, um, if, if this is expected or not. Okay, so we also uh, use isotopes in, in a whole bunch of other different ways. So these are some sediment core or sedimentary records, probably not from cores, probably from actual exposures of measurements of isotopes in rocks that are telling us something potentially about past climate. Okay? So these are um, from the um, early um, um, tertiary, uh, so the, the uh, Paleocene, Eocene, Ligocene. Um, so we're kind of like up here at the moment in terms of age. Um, and we can see that they've got some variation in the isotopes, in this case oxygen isotopes preserved in carbonates. We might want to be able to use our knowledge of how isotopes works to interpret what this means in terms of climate change. Okay, and similarly, you can do the same kind of things for different isotope systems, so carbon isotopes on the right there. Okay, so I'm just going to summarise now a few bits from the introductory lecture that are, are, are the most important. Um, not that the other stuff isn't important, but this is important. Um, so we have this notation in isotope uh, um, geochemistry, uh, where we rather than use the absolute ratio of two isotopes, so if we were looking at oxygen isotopes, we might measure the ratio of oxygen 18 to oxygen 16, and that will be some number 
Okay? But rather than write out that number, because the actual variations are very small, and actually because we can't measure the absolute value very precisely. Okay? We can only measure it relative to some standard value. Okay, so uh, this, is, this, is, this equation here, so we're looking at the ratio that we measure in the sample relative to the ratio we measure in, in a standard, uh, minus 1 here. So this is effectively the ratio in the standard minus the ratio in the sample divided by the ratio in the standard. Okay, so it's basically looking at the difference in the isotope ratio. Um, and, uh, yes, yeah, so that's, that's explained down below. Um, and we usually times it by 1,000 because the ratio changes are very small. Um, so there's this um, other key thing from the, from the, um, from the video uh, was that uh, isotopes can exchange between different phases. So if you have some CO2 or some water kind of sitting in a, in a box, kind of, kind of all sealed away, um, the CO2 and the water will exchange atoms with each other, okay? Um, and uh, that will lead to isotopes being kind of mixed between the two phases, okay? So this is what's happening in this equation at the top. So that's quite easy for something like CO2 and water, okay? That could happen very quickly because CO2 actually reacts with water, so there'll be a chemical process that will aid that exchange of atoms between the two phases, Okay. For other systems, okay, so if you had quartz and water, okay, if you put a lump of quartz in some water, the, the, the atoms would find it very hard to exchange between the water and the quartz. Okay. They would exchange, but very, very slowly. And they exchange much faster at higher temperatures. So when the quartz was, was forming in some hydrothermal system, perhaps, or some vein or something like that, then... The, the, the oxygen in the fluid, or the oxygen in the water of the fluid, would be exchanging with the oxygen in the quartz. Okay? So isotope exchange can happen very easily, but in some cases it, it, it happens very, very slowly. And that's kind of useful, uh, because if it, if, it, if it was always exchanging, okay, then we wouldn't preserve any kind of signal from the past. All of the isotope exchange would represent the modern conditions. So it's really important that the isotopes can exchange between phases, but then it's also important that they can't. Okay? Um, so in systems like um, with calcium carbonate and water, there's an exchange between the water and the calcium carbonate as the calcium carbonate is growing, as the, as the minerals are forming, but once they're formed, it's then very hard to exchange between the two phases. Um, so this exchange between the two, um, in this case CO2 and water, can be expressed as a fractionation factor. So this is very similar to uh, uh, an equilibrium constant in chemistry, which is just the, the concentration of the, the, the reactants divided by the products. And if you go through and do that for this equation, which actually has the same phases on both sides, you end up having the ratio of 18 to 16 uh, water, divided by the 18 to 16 um, CO2. Okay. I think it might, might be the other way around, but that's gone through in the, in the introductory video. So that leads to this relationship that relates the ra isotope ratio in two phases okay, with this thing called the fractionation factor. Okay. Now, uh, in the video, we go through um, how this fractionation factor is related to the difference in delta values between two phases. Okay? And that can be taken a little bit further into this delta value, this big delta, the difference, the isotope ratio between two different phases, and uh, some, some equation that's got log alpha in it. Okay? And that's, that, at the time, that might have looked like a little bit of like pointless mathematical rearranging. Okay? But it is important that we can have an equation that has log alpha, okay? so log the fractionation factor, and the difference between two isotope phases. Okay? And that will become apparent um, in a bit. Okay? It should become apparent from the video, in fact. Um, so just a quick summary of the, the, there's quite a lot in the video about, about the bonding environment between, um, between two atoms and how that affected the isotope fractionation. Um, so this is kind of a summary of that. So if you don't 
if you don't get all of the, the mechanisms and quantum physics of why it is, okay, these are the important kind of take-home points. Okay, so heavier isotopes tend to form stronger bonds. So if you have a hydrogen-hydrogen bond, okay, that's not as strong as a hydrogen-deuterium bond. Okay? Um, so because of that, um, those reactions that involve heavier isotopes, there's, it takes more energy to break those stronger bonds. So they have a higher activation energy. Okay? And having a higher activation energy is important for kinetics. We'll come on to that in a bit. Um, it also leads to heavier isotopes preferentially being kind of fractionated into bonds that are stronger. Okay, it's kind of a like-for-like like kind of thing. So if you have two uh, compounds, two phases, say water and CO2, uh, or um, water and carbonate, the heavier isotopes will preferentially be found in the substance that has the stronger bonding environment. Okay. Um, and then we have these two types of isotope fractionation. We have an equilibrium isotope fractionation and a kinetic isotope fractionation. So the, the equilibrium isotope fractionation is, is purely due to this preference of uh, different isotopes to go into different strength bonding environments. So if you let everything get to equilibrium, if you, if you leave your system for a long enough time, the isotopes will be partitioned dependent on the relative bonding strengths and the temperature. We'll get onto that in a bit. Whereas with kinetic isotope fractionation, that's specific to chemical reactions that only go in one direction. Okay? So they only go from products to reactants. There's no back reaction. Um, and that's important because the, uh, of this activation energy thing up here, where um, uh, heavier isotopes will react more slowly. Therefore, if you only take the reaction one way and the reaction doesn't complete, so if you don't convert all of your products into all reactants, then that will leave behind some of the heavier isotopes. So your products will always be enriched in lighter isotopes. We'll go on to talk about this in detail. So an uh, example of, uh, of this would be, um, would be photosynth photosynthesis. So this is a a reaction which I've swiped, I think, from the um, oceanography lectures. So this is, it should be quite familiar to some of you, uh, at least, where CO2 and water make organic matter and oxygen. Now, the thing about this reaction is that it's drawn here as photosynthesis one way, and it's got a back reaction of decomposition, okay? So of respiration. So that's not true. They're totally separate reactions, okay? So photosynthesis is not the opposite of respiration. Okay, so um, they're, 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 totally, they're totally, totally separate. So you have to consider them as unidirectional reactions. This is just including lots of the, uh, the nutrients involved. Um, photosynth photosynthesis actually looks like this, okay, where you've got, um, uh, you use energy from light to take water and split it into hydrogen ions and oxygen using various adenosine triphosphate. Uh, molecules to give you lots of power. Um, and then that uh, hydrogen then uh, is used to convert that CO2 into sugar. Okay? So, um, see, these reactions only go in one direction. Okay, so this is, this is, this is, this is, that, this is that reason why the activation energy matters. So this is the Arrhenius uh, equation for reaction rate. So, um, just to forewarn you, there will be lots of Ks today uh, that, that mean slightly different things, which is annoying. Um, so, uh, A in this case will also appear as something else, but in this case, A is just a constant, um, almost meaningless. Um, so, the activation energy here is negative. Uh, so, negative activation energy. So, that means that when the activation energy is high, the reaction rate <coughs> is slow. So, for heavier isotopes, we have slower reaction rates which means that basically the, the lighter isotopes get into the products faster than the heavier isotopes. So if you only converted 1% of the CO2 into sugar that you had, then that sugar would be very much enriched in the lighter isotopes because only the lighter isotopes managed to finish their reaction 
before the heavy ones could kind of catch up. Okay, so there's another effect on kinetics in that, and this is this is this is um, limited to, to only kind of uh, not 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 all chemical reactions do this. But if you just think about how molecules will be moving around in a in a medium in, in a gas or a liquid um, at any one temperature, the um, the the, the molecules have an average kinetic energy. Okay, so that's effectively what temperature is. Temperature is the average kinetic energy of stuff in a thing. Uh, molecules or atoms in a, in a gas or liquid or solid. Okay? So that the more temperature, the hotter something is, the faster or the, the more kinetic energy those things will be moving around. Now if they have, if say, a if this is made up of heavy and light isotopes, the heavy and the light isotopes will have the same kinetic energy because they will have the same temperature because they're in the same thing. But because the lighter isotopes are lighter, that means they will be moving faster. Okay, because kinetic energy is a half mv squared. Okay, so this means that uh, because the lighter isotopes are moving around faster, they will diffuse faster through or across any gradient of concentration. So reactions that involve diffusion are also subject to kinetic isotope fractionation because the lighter isotopes will get to the finish first. Okay, so this is useful. Uh, this is used quite a lot, uh, particularly in um, ecological sciences, um, looking at uh, using isotopes to, to, as a marker of trophic levels. Okay, because as isotopes basically move their woo, <coughs> woo, woo way, move their way through uh, a food web, at every stage in that food web, the isotopes are fractionated. Okay, so. Uh, we take carbon out of the atmosphere or the ocean. We produce kind of organic matter. So that will, that will impart a, a, an isotope fractionation. Uh, and then that stuff gets eaten, and that imparts an isotope fractionation, and so on, so on, so on, so on. Okay. Um, so this is an example of that. So this is uh, uh, a paper I found yesterday where someone was looking at Italian princes and uh, Yorkshire monks. Um, Yorkshire monks are in... Um, uh, the open symbols. So from this, you, you can basically plot up the isotope composition of, of different things that, 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 um, that, so you have like the primary producers down here, plants get eaten by herbivores, eaten by omnivores, eaten by carnivores. Okay? So from this, you can see that the diet of European princes and, um, and medieval um, Yorkshire um, monks was very similar. So they're a very high status diet, see seafood is way up here. So um, I guess this, so the, one of the reasons I put up this plot was it's actually quite complicated in terms of, it's, you can see that um, the, you get a fractionation as you go up maybe trophic level, as you go up trophic level, but it also matters what your starting isotope composition was. So these guys are getting their CO2 from the atmosphere, whereas these guys are getting their CO2 from the ocean. So they might have very different starting compositions <coughs> that are affecting what ultimate isotope ratio you measure. Um, so we'll come back to this uh, here. But um, uh, there's also additional processes in here. When we go through this process of respiration, okay, or um, methanogenesis, if we're breaking down the waste material from all these organisms, there's an isotope fractionation associated with that as well. So that doesn't take you back to the starting composition, okay? Because it's a one-way kind of uh, isotope fractionation. So you don't end up producing CO2 that is the same isotopic composition as what you started with when you go through all of this. Um, so this is the example of methanogenesis. So this takes kind of organic matter here and it's actually a series of quite complex chemical reactions involving all of these kind of like totally unpronounceable, unrememberable polyphenol or aromatic kind of <laughs> compounds here. But as you go from one thing to the other, it's a one-way reaction. So for each of these steps, the carbon gets progressively lighter as you kind of go on. So you've got progressively less carbon-13, more carbon-12. So if you look at 
the carbon isotopes of things in the environment. So um, I guess the bulk earth, volcanic CO2 is probably somewhere around here. Um, the atmosphere is, is here, um, uh, dissolved in organic carbon here. So we've got delta 13C on the, on the x-axis here. So to the right, these are more enriched in the carbon 13, heavier isotopes. To the left, more enriched in the lighter isotopes, carbon 12. Um, so you see if we put on uh, things like um, uh, the, the methane that are products of this um, uh, methanogenesis, so this is the breakdown of organic matter, that's very, very, very light compared to everything else because it's been through all of these processes. We start out with the atmosphere, we grow plants, C4, C3, and can plants, so these are different basically mechanisms by which photosynthesis, photo, photo, blah, photosynthesis works within the cell. Okay? Um, so this leads to lighter organic material, and then that organic material is ultimately respired and methanogized to, um, to this, these methane. So as you go from one stage to the other stage to the other stage, we get lighter and lighter carbon. So I'll just stop here and think about, does this make sense? Uh, so we've got isotope fractionation. In this case, because it's biological in one way, uh, it's, um, it's kinetic isotope fractionation. Okay, we don't go to completion because not all of the CO2 has been converted from the atmosphere into plants in any one go. Um, so we're getting lighter and lighter and lighter carbon as we go through the system. Okay, uh, if we look at the uh, food webs though, so these ones, we look as we go from one thing to the other, so from plants to herbivores, omnivores, carnivores, uh, we, we seem to be getting more positive with our isotope ratio. So we go from negative 24 to negative kind of 20. So that doesn't make sense. Because whatever what I've told you is that the products become lighter and lighter and lighter. So that the reason for this is that with thinking, well, certainly I was thinking that the the plant the like a sheep is not the product of grass. Okay, and the this pig is not the product of sheep. Okay, so it's not a chemical reaction where you get sheep and you do something, and then you get pig. Um, what's happening here is that the, the think of each animal in this chain as a basically as a kind of like a, a a factory, a biological factory. And actually, what it's producing is not the next animal up in the chain. What that what the most kind of carbon output from each of these animals is actually their waste. Okay. So because so the, the animal takes in carbon from its food, it produces waste, a lot of waste through its entire lifetime. Okay? So that waste production process is the thing that's forming the isotope fractionation. So basically, sheep crap is isotopically light compared to the carbon that it's taking in, which means that the carbon left behind in the sheep is isotopically heavy. Okay, so that enrichment is what's causing this trend up here. Same thing in the marine food web, but we're just starting from a different point on the diagram. Okay, and if you can look at up here, that kind of makes sense. If you look at the, these guys are getting their um, carbon from marine plankton, which should be probably somewhere around here, um, and marine plankton is getting its carbon from. Uh, dissolved inorganic carbon. It's actually getting it from the CO2 from dissolved inorganic carbon, which is slightly, because inorganic carbon, dissolved inorganic carbon is CO2 plus bicarbonate plus carbonate. There's an isotope fractionation between each of those carbon species. So when you add them all up, you get an isotope ratio of this, but actually the CO2 that's, um, uh, the CO2 that's in the, uh, Dissolved in organic carbon is a little bit lighter. Okay, but you can see here that the atmosphere is is isotopically lighter than the ocean, and you can see here that um, the atmospherically derived carbon is lighter than marine derived carbon. So, that, I mean, the, the take-home message from this side is that that we can we can use the isotope fractionation to to discriminate both source, okay, of carbon. So, is it from the terrestrial or from the 
marine, but we can also use it to tell us something about the process, so how far we're up and down the, this trophic food web, okay? which is kind of both useful and unfortunate because we've got basically two unknowns and only one thing. Okay? You can say, oh, well, we'll just measure another isotope ratio. We could use nitrogen isotopes, and that would be, be fine, but you can see that they're almost perfectly correlated to each other, so it doesn't actually provide us with any more information. So we always have to think very carefully when we're using isotopes is that they're quite often telling us... Okay, um, so kinetic isotope fractionation. I think I've said all this stuff. Um, so these two re reactions at the bottom here are the, basically the formation of um, sugars from CO2, and the carbon-12 reaction is faster than the carbon-13 reaction. Okay. Okay. So moving on now to the equilibrium case. So this is where we basically leave our products and reactants alone for long enough for the isotopes to fully exchange between the phases so they're in some kind of equilibrium. So uh, again, this was gone over in more detail in the introductory video, which um, some of you have watched, which is good. Um, but if we just take this, this example here, where we've got water and hydrogen sulfide. So this is hydrogen sulfide, where one of the hydrogens is a deuterium. OK, so same on both sides, except we're just exchanging the atoms of hydrogen and deuterium between those molecules. So if the, uh, we, can, we can write this as uh, basically as a chemical uh, equilibrium um, reaction. So equilibrium constant equals products over reactants, okay? You can rearrange that to give you the isotope ratios of water and the isotope ra ratios of hydrogen sulfide. Now, if the isotopes were just randomly, uniformly distributed, the isotope ratios in, in each phase should be the same. So this should be a ratio of 1, okay? In this case, it's a ratio of 2.35, which is a really, really extreme isotope fractionation. So usually, these... these uh, um, so these, this is basically what defines the fractionation factor. So you think of the fractionation factor as an equilibrium constant for isotope exchange equations. So uh, they're, they're usually 1.0 something. Okay, so they're much, usually much, much closer to 1. But in this case, we have a really, really big um, isotope fractionation. So if we go back to the analogy of thinking this as a, um, as a chemical equilibria, okay, uh, we would have this thermodynamic relationship here, okay, between delta G, so the free energy of the reaction, um, and the equilibrium constant, okay, and the log, natural log of the equilibrium constant. Okay, so this is why it was important for us to kind of do that mathematical manipulation and get something where, where log alpha, log the, the fractionation factor, equals some difference between isotope ratios, because this means that we can then take the difference between two isotopic difference between two phases that we can measure and convert that into something that is related to the fractionation factor and something that is related critically to temperature. We'll come on to that in a bit. Okay? But if this because this isn't one, that means that there must be some free energy that's forcing the isotopes not to be uniformly distributed. And that's this kind of, I guess I call it the, I don't know what Jeff calls it, but I call it the, the master thermodynamic equation. It kind of seems to be important for absolutely everything, because it, it kind of is. So for any reaction, okay, for it, to, for it to work, this has to be kind of negative. You have to provide some, has to be some, some free energy driving the reaction. You've got some uh, enthalpy, okay, and you've got some entropy over here. Okay, in this case, the entropy in terms of isotopes is provided by mixing of the isotopes. So if the isotopes are completely well mixed, that's the most entropy -y state. Okay, whereas if they were, if you put all of the isotopes in one of one isotope in one place and all the, the other isotopes in the other place are heavy and light and you separated them completely, that would be the most ordered state of you could have your isotopes, right? Which would be the, the lowest entropy. The highest disorder would be complete mixing. Okay? Uh, whereas this um, uh, delta H, the enthalpy here, is driven by that preference of the isotopes to be in their most favourite bond. So the heavy isotopes want to be in the stronger bonds, 
the lighter isotopes therefore will be in the, the, the less strong bonds. So that's what's driving this term, okay? And this one is basically just driven by mixing. So this means that there is a temperature dependence to this delta G because this matters more, yeah, at higher temperatures. So that means that we can then have an equation that's related to that delta G equals RT log uh, alpha that is related between the fractionation factor and specifically the natural log of the fractionation factor and some equation that has temperature in it. Okay, so typically at low temperatures we have this uh, 1 over T relationship and at higher temperatures it tends to be 1 over T squared. Okay, so, um, so this is why isotopes can then be used um, to act as basically a paleothermometer. So if we, if we know the isotope ratio, the delta values of two phases that formed at isotopic equilibrium, okay, we can then infer from that log alpha and therefore the temperature. So this is, this is an example from the high temperature kind of geological world where maybe some quartz and some magnetites were growing in, uh, were precipitating as some fluid in equilibrium each, with each other. So as the, the minerals were both growing at the same time, isotopes could exchange between their surfaces, okay, and obviously and the fluid that they're within. Um, and if we know uh, log alpha, okay, we can then kind of read that off and then we can work out what temperature that mineral pair precipitated at. Okay, which is quite useful if you want to know that, because that might help you predict what other minerals might be precipitating at that temperature and those conditions, which is useful if you want to find things like gold, which, um, you know, is shiny. Um, okay, so uh, what we're looking for in a system to have a big isotope fractionation, to make it useful as a, something that's easy to measure and use as a paleothermometer, so uh, elements that have a low atomic mass... Okay, it's things like oxygen, carbon, hydrogen. They're quite light elements. So if you have a difference of one in the isotope, say a difference of two in the case of oxygen between uh, oxygen 16 and 18, that's a big relative difference in the mass of those isotopes. Whereas if you had, uh, let's say, um, thallium, thallium 204 and thallium 205, that's a much smaller relative difference in masses. So there'll be a much smaller isotope fractionation associated with those isotopes. Okay, so um, so the, the, the mass of the, the element is important. Um, if you uh, have um, bonding environments in your chemistry, in the two phases that you're interested in, that are covalent rather than ionically bonded, that, that means that they've got a, they're basically more energy in the spring part of those bonds, okay? which, which leads to, to uh, more isotope fractionation. Um, and then, typically, if you can have basically very, very different bonding environments, okay, so it's no good, well, you, so if you had two phases, both which were equally strongly bonded, okay, then there wouldn't be much of a difference in, in isotope preference for those two bonds, so there'd be a small fractionation. So, uh, sometimes you have elements, say, like iron, um, that have different oxidation states, iron 2 and iron 3, yeah, and... Quite often, those result in the iron being bound in a very different bonding environment when it's in those different oxidation states. So elements which, which are, do have this, this strong redox chemistry do also tend to have quite a strong um, isotope fractionation, which is quite useful because we can then sometimes use the isotope ratio uh, recorded in, in those compounds to tell us something about the past redox conditions, which is quite neat. Okay, so some, some, some examples now. So think about what would happen uh, if we were to burn lots of fossil fuels, what that would do to the carbon-13 of the atmosphere. So uh, let's just have, let's just, I guess those of you that have got the presentation downloaded, this will be a very easy question. Um, so those of you who think the carbon-13 of the atmosphere will go up, raise your hands. Those of you who think it will go down, raise your hands. Oh, you guys are so weak. I mean, you've literally got the presentation in front of you. <laughs> no? It's not in there. That slide. 
Um, so here you can see uh, the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere going up. This is the pink curve. Okay. And you can see the carbon uh, isotope ratio measured in the CO2 in the atmosphere coming down. So this is the um, delta 13C. And this is, this is because the carbon that we're adding to the atmosphere is from a fossil fuel. That fossil fuel is the product of organic matter. So organic matter is formed from CO2 in the atmosphere. Okay, by some biological process. Okay, photosynthesis. Photosynthesis. Okay, and then maybe some methanogenesis as well to produce our natural gas. So that means that fossil fuels have a very, very light uh, carbon isotope ratio. So if we add it to the atmosphere, we can see that it's going down. So in this case, uh, we're using isotopes as a tracer of the source. Okay, so we're looking. For, we know that the carbon uh, dioxide is going up. Where's that from? Okay. So we know it must be from a source of carbon that's isotopically light compared to the atmosphere. So this is an example where we're using the isotopes as a, basically a fingerprint tracer of where something is coming from. Okay. So this is this is that thing here. So we basically uh, here's uh, uh, here's the atmosphere. Here's the ocean. So we know that the CO2 is not coming out of the ocean because that would force the, the ratio up. It's not coming from limestone. So it's not, we, we're burning lots of limestone to produce um, cement. So cement burning is one of, one of the larger contributors to um, atmospheric CO2 other than uh, burning fossil fuels directly. Um, so that would be pu pushing, if most of our CO2 anthropogenic was coming from uh, uh, making cement, we would expect the carbon isotope ratio of the atmosphere to go up. It's going down, so it's not as important as this stuff over here. So petroleum, methane, much, much, much lighter, is able to change the atmospheric um, CO2 carbon isotopes much more easily. So we can look... Um, we can look back in time as well at some of these processes. So this is an example from oh, OAE2. I think that's in the Cretaceous. Um, so this is, uh, this is a sequence of sediments um, that are similar in all kind of uh, um, Cretaceous kind of deposits worldwide. You get these conditions where you might have lots of carbonates laid down. And then there's this, this event that happens where basically you have a lot of organic matter preserved in the sediments. And then we go back to being carbonate rich. Okay, so we have lots of kind of organic rich shales. Um, and that's reflected in, uh, in this curve here. So this is the carbon isotopes. But in this, this time, it's the carbon isotopes, not of the whole rock. It's just of the calcium carbonate portion. And you can see here that that goes from being kind of positive. And during this interval of uh, organic rich shale deposition, it goes more positive. Okay, so what's happening here is that this is not a signal of a source of CO2 to the atmosphere. What this is is a signal of removal. So uh, we start off having lots of carbon in the system, dissolved in the ocean, in the atmosphere. And then there's some event that happens here, which means that the, the ocean starts to become anoxic. So uh, the levels of oxygen, in the, particularly in the deep ocean, go to almost zero. And this stops organic matter being respired, okay? which means that we're effectively removing more and more organic matter into sediments globally. Uh, and you can see that here because the sediments are full of organic matter. That means that we're removing light organic carbon and putting that, hiding that away in sediments. Okay? So... That means that the carbon that's left behind in the dissolved inorganic carbon and in the atmosphere must then become more heavy. Okay, must be more enriched in the heavier isotopes. Um, and we can see that here in the carbon isotopes uh, that are preserved in, in the carbonate that's left because that's forming not from the organic matter, but that's forming from the dissolved inorganic carbon, okay. um, which is being forced to become more heavy, more positive in terms of delta 13C, because the light carbon is being removed. So in this case, isotopes are responding to a removal, not an addition. Um, 
So this is this is a this is another example. So this is uh, the Paleo Eocene, or I guess it's now called the Late Paleocene uh, Thermal Maximum, which is this this event here uh, about 55.5 million years ago. So this was a, a time when the, the Earth was very very warm, and then all of a sudden it got a lot warmer, a lot quicker. Um, so there was this sudden event. Uh, so time is going from old to young on this side. Um, you can see this, well, we start with the oxygen isotopes. The oxygen isotopes, we'll come on to later, are being used as a proxy for temperature in this case. Uh, so these are oxygen isotopes preserved in marine carbonates, and we'll see later on why that's a proxy for temperature. Um, so we get to this point here, and then all of a sudden it gets very, very warm. Okay, and then it starts to cool down over time. Um, and we have this uh, similar signature in the carbon isotopes. And in this case, the carbon isotopes shoot down to this really, really low value. Okay, so they're being enriched very much in the light isotopes. So what this is telling us is um, either we've stopped burying organic carbon, okay, so that would mean that we're no longer removing um, uh, the light organic carbon, so uh, the ocean can become light again, so the opposite of what, what happened in the, um, in the previous example, or something is being added to the system that's got lots of light organic carbon in. Okay? So by combining these two records, okay, we know it's getting warmer, so that does suggest that we're adding some CO2 to the atmosphere, and in this case, because it's got so much, uh, um, so much uh, more negative here, the main kind of candidate here is kind of a sudden release of methane into the atmosphere, which has a powerful greenhouse gas effect, which explains the warming, and also explains the uh, negative carbon isotopes uh, in, the, uh, in the marine carbon pool. Okay, so those were some examples about how we can use stable isotopes to tell us stuff about the environment. Okay, so we're going to go and uh, investigate in a little bit more detail now um, some of the, 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 the processes that are actually going on uh, when these isotopes fractionate. So uh, with water, uh, if you're just considering water and water vapour, uh, the, um, the bonding environment between the two is a little bit stronger in the water than it is in the water vapour. So even though it's the same molecule... Okay, you've got more bonding in water than you have in, in water vapor because of all of the hydrogen bonds. Okay, so this means that if you have a container that's got some water in it and therefore some water vapor in the headspace and you seal that container, you don't let anything in or out and you leave that for a while, um, the water will be 9 per mil. I haven't really explained what per mil was, but per mil is like percent but just divided by 1,000. So that's what we quite often use for describing isotope fractionation. So it's 9 per mil heavier in the water than in the, than the, in the water vapour in the atmosphere. Um, so that's if you, if you leave it kind of, um, kind of for long enough so the, the isotopes can equilibrate. But in the, in the natural environment, that, that very rarely happens. Uh, okay, Because if you might have some water that evaporates out of the ocean or a lake or some river, but then usually the wind blows that water away from where it's evaporated from. Okay? So there's usually, and you, we don't always have 100% humidity. Okay? So not, we haven't reached that equilibrium between evaporation and condensation. So that means that there's also a uh, small kinetic isotope fractionation, okay? which leads to this slightly additional um, fractionation. So, so water vapour tends to be a little bit more than 9 per mil lighter than the, the water. It tends to be about um, uh, 13 per mil. Okay, so we're going to now think about the opposite process of condensation. So um, imagine that we had um, kind of two, we considering the light isotope and the heavy isotope separately. Okay, and we're going to call the light isotope A and the heavy isotope B, I think. Um, now, the uh, rates of, of condensation or evaporation, but we think about condensation, okay, are just the rate of change of A 
compared relative to how much you, you have to start off with. Okay. So we can think about the fractionation factor as being just the difference, or basically not the difference, but the ratio of the two um, uh, condensation rates. So the isotope that con condenses faster will lead to an isotope fractionation. So we can basically express that here as this fractionation factor is just the ratio of the two um, uh, equilibrium, well, the two rate constants, okay, which are these up here. Okay, so we can we can rearrange that. Okay, we can basically plug these equations into this equation. Get this guy. Um, so that then can be arranged to put all of the A's on one side, all of the B's on the other side, to give us this equation here, okay, which um, we can then integrate to give this equation here. So integrating 1 over A is gives you log A. Um, and then critically we can then say, because to get rid of this uh, unknown constant, we can then plug in, uh, assume that, Basically, the starting composition, the amount that we start with, is a zero here, okay, and then do that, set that to set that to one, and then we end up with this equation at the bottom. So if you then go through and divide uh, both sides of that equation by a over a naught, okay, because a log a minus log a naught is log a naught log a over a naught, yeah? Um, we, we can then start to simplify that out. We can go through this. Uh, this so this, this is how you get to this is not going to be on the exam, but you can ultimately show that because um, there we go, um, because you end up with something that looks a bit like this, um, is equal to this thing here. It's where f is the fraction remaining, which is effectively a over a naught. Okay, so if you start with kind of an amount of stuff and then A is the amount of stuff that you, you have at any one time, that is just F um, and that, that, that leads you to this equation here. So what this means, okay, so if we just look at this graph here. So if we start out with, so the other one we've got the fraction remaining. Okay, so we start out with, okay, here at that point there. So that's where we've got all of our stuff is remaining and the difference between our two phases is zero because we haven't we haven't fractionated anything yet. Okay, so if we start to condense some water, say, so the first little bit of water that we're going to condense, okay, that will be isotopically heavy, right? That will be here. Okay, water vapor is here, and the first bit of condensate is there. Okay, now if we condensed all of the water that was in the vapor into the liquid phase if we converted 100% of it, then we must end up with exactly what we started with. Okay? Now, if we kept, um, if we kept all of that in uh, a, a sealed container, okay, um, we knew maybe a, a halfway, somewhere along here, then the isotopic composition of the combined condensate would just follow the red line, and the water vapor would follow the, the dashed red line. Now, what this equation up here shows is what happens if you take away the water every time you condense it. Okay? So if you start here, okay, and you precipitate, you condense out some water of this composition, okay, and then you let that maybe drain out of your container. You hide it away. That means that you've taken out of the, the whole system something that's got a heavy isotope ratio, which means everything that's left must be lighter. Okay, so that forces us down a little bit along this blue line. So if you carry on doing that, okay, you're constantly removing stuff that's a set amount lighter than, the, than whatever is left in your container. So that constantly forces you down this dotted line here. So once we've condensed out most of the uh, water from our container of water vapour, the last little bit of water vapour that's left will be extremely light, okay, because you've progressively removed the water um, from that, or progressively removed all of the heavy isotopes from that. So that's what this equation up here 
shows. Um, so this is this is actually relevant um, to, uh, to geosciences quite a lot because this is what happens with the atmosphere. Okay, so we start out with the ocean here, okay, and then we evaporate the ocean to form water vapor above the oceans, and that's typically lighter than the oceans. So if the ocean starts at zero per mil, uh, the water vapor is at minus 13. So. So that water vapour doesn't stay in the atmosphere, it rains out, okay? For those of you familiar with Scotland, it rains out quite a lot. So the first kind of rain cloud, that will rain out some water, and that will be heavier than the water vapour, okay? So it may be 9 per mil uh, or so uh, heavier, and that will rain some out. But the remaining water vapour that's left over in the atmosphere, okay, because rain clouds don't remove all of the water from the atmosphere, that will be left to be lighter. Okay? So as your cloud progressively moves along, okay, it gets, uh, actually it's not a cloud, it's that the atmosphere has got, that doesn't have a cloud in, has got just as much water in as the atmosphere with a cloud in. So as the pa parcel of atmosphere that's got moisture in, as that moves over land, as it progressively moves over land, it gets lighter and lighter and lighter. So the precipitation that's falling out of it also gets lighter and lighter and lighter. So it's not just the distance away from a coastline which this happens. This happens on a global scale. So as moisture is transported from the tropics, okay, through the Walker circulation to the polar regions, the isotop isotopic composition of precipitation gets lighter and lighter and lighter. So polar rainfall is much more uh, light than tropical rainfall. Okay? Um, the intensity of rainfall also can affect um, the, uh, the, the isotope composition. So where you have much more effective removal of, of water from the atmosphere, that will lead to a heavier isotopic signature. Okay? Um, so it can be used for tracking the, um, the intensity of atmospheric water transport, which is really quite useful. So if, you, if you're wanting to, say, for instance, investigate the strength of the monsoon system over geological time, if you could get a, an archive that records the isotopic composition of rainfall, okay, that will tell you how effective this transport of water is. So imagine, instead of just being some arbitrary cartoon, say this is India, and say this is the Himalayas. So the isotopic composition of, of water falling here is a, is a function of how much uh, rain has happened in this interval, uh, the isotopic composition of the ocean, which does change, but doesn't change by much. So if we get much, much lighter isotopic composition up here, that means that we've had much more rain falling out over India. Okay, so there are records of this, so we don't actually have the fossil rainwater, okay, but we have some proxy for that. Maybe fossil leaves, something that's produced from rainwater, so maybe a speleothem. Okay, and we can see variations in the isotopic composition that have, um, that have basically recording the rainfall. Now, the, the most, I guess the, 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 the case where this matters kind of the, I wouldn't say the most, but uh, is, is, will become very relevant to quite a lot of you, is that what if this rain didn't just run off the land? What if we could store it somewhere? So we're taking basically light isotopes, we're making them progressively more light, okay? And then if we stored them on the top of this mountain, that means we've basically got a store of light isotopes. Now, if that store's big enough, okay, we can start to think about we're actually taking light isotopes out of the ocean and storing them on land. Okay? So this is, this is what happens during glacial periods where we're taking water out of the ocean, we're transporting it to the, the high uh, latitudes, to the, to the northern polar <coughs> regions in Antarctica, that transport process fractionates the isotopes even more because you're constantly raining out as you're on the way. So the precipitation is extremely light in terms of its light isotopes when it falls out on top of an ice sheet. And if you build that ice sheet, that means that you're storing up lighter and lighter isotopes on the land, which means your, your ocean is progressively getting less, less negative, so more positive. Okay? So if you think about the, the mass balance is not really in the favour of changing that because the oceans are really big, okay, to, um, uh, to quote BP, uh, the oceans are really, really big, okay, even compared to ice sheets, so ice sheets are really, really big, but the oceans are much, much bigger, 
But because the isotope fractionation is so huge getting into an ice sheet, it gets to be 10, maybe even 100 per mil uh, light, uh, the ocean can be moved around by a few per mil. Okay, and this is what we see here. So this is a, a compilation of, uh, of records produced from calcium carbonate in marine fossils um, in the deep ocean. So there's, a, there's an additional fractionation here between the water and the carbonate. Okay, but we can see here that, the, the, that on glacial kind of like times, we have more positive values being preserved in the ocean than we do in interglacial times. Okay? So this is due to the, the basically continental water storage. So there's also an effect of temperature because this is not, uh, this is not, we're not measuring the water, we're measuring something that's precipitated from the water, the calcium carbonate. So there'll be a fractionation between the water and the carbonate. And we've seen that that should be temperature dependent. So there's a temperature dependency in this as well, which we'll see in the practical. Um, so just finally, one more example um, that is kind of useful. So it's not just water um, or carbonate or minerals that, that, that can, can cause isotope fractionation. We can also use it to look at nutrients. Okay, so the nutrient nitrate. So unfortunately, phosphorus only has one isotope, so uh, we can't look at phosphate. Um, so similarly, if we've got uh, marine nitrate, we start out maybe somewhere here, and then we, we form some organic matter. So that organic nitrogen is going to be lighter than our... our um, so this is no longer in big delta. These are the real values of delta N15, not the difference between the two phases. Um, so we can look at... We'll initially start to form organic matter that's, that's isotopically light. Okay? And if we turn all of the nitrate into organic matter, we'll end up with the same composition. Okay? Um, but if we start removing our organic matter and putting that in marine sediments being exported out of the surface ocean, okay, the, the nitrates that's left over will follow uh, this blue line. Right? And the, the, every time we produce some organic matter, it'll start to follow this dashed line here. So if we look at what's actually being recorded in the sediments, okay, if we, rather than look at the instantaneous composition of organic matter that's being produced, if we look at what the total amount that's being recorded in the sediments, that should follow this blue line down here, which is basically just the integral of, of this, this line here. So that what this means is if we look in a marine sediment core and we find uh, that we have a, a very, very positive um, nitrogen isotope value, that means that of all of the nitrate that was there, we've used it all up. Okay? Whereas if we start to have more negative nitrogen isotope values, it means that there was some nitrate there, but we didn't use it all up. We left some behind in the ocean for some reason. Okay? And this is kind of useful because there are places in the ocean where that happens. So in this is a map of nitrate concentration. So you can see most of the ocean is blue. That means that life uses up all the available nutrients, okay, because it's going, ooh, there's some light, I've got some nutrients, I'm going to make some carbon, it's going to be fun. Um, but there are bits of the ocean where the nutrients don't get used up. So that could be because in the polar regions it's dark half the year. It could be because there are other things limiting the amount of light, of, no, the amount of uh, life that can go on. So in, in cases like the North Pacific and, the, and the, the tropical Pacific and maybe sometimes in the Southern Ocean as well, we're actually being limited by other nutrients, so mostly iron. So if you don't have enough iron, you can't use up all of the nutrients available to you. So if you look now, so we're just doing a cross-section through one of these uh, uh, regions here. So it's, they're, they're quite often referred to as high, high nutrients, low chlorophyll. So they've got lots of nutrients available, but not a lot of life is going on. Okay. So if we look at the, the concentration of nitrate in the surface ocean, that's the, these, these, these black dots here. So you can see as you cross the equator, okay, we have lots of nutrients available. Um, and if you look at the isotopes, you can see that we have, um, we have positive uh, nitrogen isotopes uh, in these blue regions out here. But as we cross the equator, the isotope ratio of the, the nitrogen in the organic matter goes down becomes more negative, and that's because we're not using up the nitrogen for some reason. So this is useful. We can go back in time. We can make records of this. 
to look at how these high nitrogen, low chlorophyll regions have changed in the past. And that's important because if these, these are regions where basically there's potential for burying more carbon because we're, life's not using up all of the nutrients. And that's, it, that's important for understanding where carbon, where, well, why the glacial had so little um, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere compared to the interglacials. Perhaps it was because these regions became much more biologically effective in removing carbon from the atmosphere. Okay, so um, this is the kind of the, the summary slide. Um, I'm not going to read through it. I'll leave it up there. Um, so these are kind of the important take-home messages from this. So, um, so here endeth the lecture part of the lecture. Um, I was kind of really hoping a demonstrator would just walk through the door and go, oh, I'm ready to do the practical, but that was probably my fault. Um, so what I have now is um, some practicals, which you will find fun. Yay. Um, so I'll hand these out. Um,